My name's John Gold and currently working as a, a mental health counselor, but for the athletes out there and the coaches out there, I work as a mental performance coach. Uh, it hasn't been a straight and narrow path, that's for sure, but like many people who'll be listening, athlete growing up, I played basketball, football, and baseball was always my number one passion. Uh, there was many times throughout my even just high school career where the mental game thought process, not being able to breathe properly. Things were just barriers for me to perform at my potential level on a consistent basis. And so, you know, it wasn't the narrow path that I, I recognized that a lot of mental performance coaches take. Uh, I pursued a coaching career immediately after my baseball career was done. Went to Brookline High School, went to Emanuel College in the colleges of Fenway in Boston Mass, right outside of Fenway Park, and it was a great opportunity to continue playing, to get a little bit of experience, a little bit of a taste of what coaching would be like, as well as a little bit of a director of operations process, if you will, managing equipment, budgeting, things of that sort, and, and the coaching side of it really appealed to me. So I went down that track, uh, connected with Dave Walsh at Fenway High School, where he was at the time, coached with him for a few years, wanted to go into the college route, and so I explored that. All while continuing to get my master's in counseling, so that's what's allowing me to be a therapist. It came a point in time where coaching wasn't really doing what I thought it would be doing. And it, my passion kind of faded very, very quickly, I would say, more so than I expected. And so I tapped right back into my counseling degree, which at the time, once I moved into coaching, I was like, I'm never gonna use this degree. It's a waste of time. I spent all this money, but you know I'm going to be a coach. So that kind of came full 180 there, and I picked up the counseling gig. Very quickly, I missed sports. So connected with some folks, talked with some individuals, and recognized that there's this whole field of sports psychology. I wish I had discovered it earlier, but everything's happened for a reason, as they say, and it led me to, to doing the work right now where I Work with a few college programs, Division Three to Division One, as well as some travel baseball organizations, and I've recently started my own consulting project, uh, GoForGold.net, where I work with individuals and teams on mental performance, helping individuals where I felt like I could have benefited, just helping them with mental skills, mental performance. It's a, it's a wonderful question that you pose because whenever I hear anyone talk about mental health, the first thing that I say is, you know, mental health and mental performance may be related in certain regards, but at the same time, there are different areas on this spectrum and this continuum of mental well-being. So when I think about mental health, I think about, you know, functioning. Like, is this person at a good mental space in their general life with friends, at work, at school, with family? And then when I think about mental performance, I think about this individual simply at their sport, and it doesn't have to be athletes. I know in this case, we're talking about baseball, softball. It could be dancers, it could be artists, it could be singers, songwriters. But I differentiate the two fields because I feel like it's necessary. Now, when you ask about how do we help individuals with these obstacles that they may face in performance realm, I think ultimately the big thing that comes with that is how we frame and how we perceive these experiences and these setbacks. It's very easy to think that, you know, an error or a mishap in the field is a threat. And it is, right? Because we care about what we're playing. We care about making that play. We want to be able to field that ground ball, throw to second base so that our teammate can make the throw over to first. And when we don't make that play, it feels like we're letting someone down and we're making a mistake. And while it is important to recognize that that is something we care about and we want to make that tr correction, we want to be able to make that play consistently, if we're able to view these experiences as opportunities and perceive them that way as opposed to a threat, then we're better able to manage ourselves in these situations. I think the way each and every single individual would handle those situations may be different, but the place where I would start is how are we viewing these experiences? Are we beating ourselves up for a quote unquote failing? 
or are we viewing these as learning opportunities? And it doesn't need to be a failure or a setback to learn because we can learn from our successes as well. It definitely connects to this threat concept because if we're thinking about making a mistake in a game and motivation and its connection to the prior, if our motivation to play a game is to, let's say it's external rather than an internal drive, like intrinsic motivation. I love the game of baseball. I love the game of softball because it connects me to friends, because I love the heat of competition, because I love trying to get to be the best version of myself in a competitive standpoint. If we don't have that understanding of internal motivation, and it's for posting on Instagram, for, well, my folks want me to do this, and it isn't coming from a genuine place, these moments where we occur these setbacks do become threats because if I'm deep-rooted in understanding why I love the game that I play, making a mistake, it's, okay, well, I really care about this. I'm driven to make a correction. I'm driven to work hard on this. I'm driven to go into my process to reflect, to make some changes, and to continue to do the work that it takes to be better and to perform the way I want to perform. If that motivator is not there in the first place, that's where we start looking into the stands, where we're more easily distracted, and it becomes, uh-oh, this may actually be a threat to my identity because I don't know why I'm playing and I don't know who I am before I even step out onto the field. So I touched base on identity there a little bit, but understanding that intrinsic drive and intrinsic genuine purpose for playing the game is crucial. I mean, I think a lot of people will go into like, what's the mental skill that I can grab to get me focused on the right thing at the right time? What's my anchor? Is it a deep breath? Is it looking at a specific point in the field? And I'd say all those things are great. What I would start with is actually understanding that if you're playing a baseball game, let's say you're playing in a, a tournament, right? And you're playing Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and there are seven inning games. You're playing 21 innings of baseball if you play that entire game. Let's say each game is three hours. You're playing nine hours of baseball, and you aren't going to get distracted, I'd say you're crazy. You're going to get distracted. So what the key is, is to understanding where your focus of attention needs to be when the next pitch is occurring. So I actually encourage athletes to zone out when they need to in between pitches. You're going to burn out if you try to stay focused for nine straight hours of baseball, or three hours one day, three the next, and three the last day. So I think about it as a funnel of attention. So if we can recognize and have a process and a routine pre-pitch, in between pitch, after pitch, where we zone out and then come back right as the pitch is occurring again, I think that's the recipe to success rather than thinking that we need to be rigid, we need to be perfect, and we need to be dialed in for an unrealistic amount of time. When it comes to a, a pre-game routine, we'll just dial in on that. And I touched base on identity a little bit. I think something really important for athletes to work through is to recognize when do you become the athlete. Uh, something that could be relevant for certain athletes is understanding the type of mentality and attitude that you need to have going into a game. So I talked to certain athletes where they're like, I play better where I'm more calm. Maybe a closer needs to be angry. They need to be more energetic. So it's, do you have this specific persona that you could tap into for when the game starts for you? Obviously, a bullpen pitcher, the game may not start for them until later. Maybe not. But understanding when the game starts for you and having a deliberate physical thing that you do to flip the switch and understand, okay, it's game time and I have the game starting for me is a great way to know where you need to be at certain moments in the game. So a simple way to do that is thinking about when do you put on that last article of clothing, right? So, or that first article of clothing, rather. So let's think about you're in the bullpen, you're waiting for the game, it starts, it's the fourth inning, you're still waiting, you're still waiting, you're still winning. Sixth inning comes up and coach tells you, hey, get ready. Maybe that sixth inning, once you get that call or that, that notification from coach, he comes and taps you on the dugout, maybe that's when you put your hat on. Maybe that's when, you know, you tighten up your wrist brace or you put your glove on and you start to do your warm-ups. 
that's different for position by position, but I think understanding maybe the persona that you have heading into the game and knowing when the game specifically starts for your performance is really important because we can find ourselves getting really anxious, really nervous, and overthinking even on just the car ride to the game or on the bench during warm-ups or during infield outfield. So knowing that trigger for you for when the game starts and the right mentality and persona that you need to play at your best may be a trick for guys. I've never really thought about it as an evolution, so it's an interesting way that you pose it, and that's something that I'm going to think on. But I would say the answer is yes. And what I mean by that is if you're playing competitive sport, what's the harm in having an additional resource to help you with something? Uh, I think about it similarly as a hitting coach or a pitching coach. If you're going to get instruction and lessons for something that you just want to improve upon, maybe not even necessarily when something's going wrong or you need a fix, just as a resource to work on your craft, what's the harm in working with someone on your breath work? What's the harm in having a conversation with someone on your self-talk? Is it productive? Is it counterproductive? On working on imagery, on working on your perspective, on learning to be more grateful and appreciative of what you have, to refine your process and your training. There, there's a boatload of different areas I could go with that uh, as far as what an individual may benefit from with working with a mental performance expert or a coach. But you know, at any point, I, I think there's never a wrong time to start, and it doesn't need to be from a deficit space either. I think a simple place to start is something that I touched upon earlier. It, it's really just understanding your routine, and that could be through having a conversation. I think a big component of preparation comes even before the game starts. Like, are you sleeping? Like, do you have a routine around your day-to-day -day to make sure that you're eating properly, to make sure that you're well nourished, to make sure that you're sleeping an adequate amount so that your muscles and, and brain can fire when you're ready to go come game day. You know, understanding who you are as an individual beyond the sport itself. So that's where the identity piece comes in as well. And then a performance routine in game to understand what is it that you need as an individual to get from one pitch to the next, transition into the pitch, compete on the pitch, and then, like I mentioned earlier, zone out or transition in between. So a routine, understanding the preparation beforehand, those are probably the first two places where I'd go, especially if it was a, a younger adolescent or a younger athlete. What I would first start with that is the higher and higher you go is that the more competitive the people around you and the, the more competitive the environment becomes. And, and the more likely that means is that you're going to experience quote unquote failure. I'm doing a lot of air quotes today. But thinking about projecting into the future and moving up from level to level, one would think, oh, you're getting better, so this is going to be easier. And it's, it's rather quite the contrary, where you're going to experience more of these setbacks, more of these distractors, more of these disappointments than you'd think. So understanding that this is always something that's becoming a part of the process from an earlier age so that it doesn't become this deficits-based approach when you're in college and no one's ever told you how to regulate your emotions, where no one's ever taught you how to work on your breath and you know, you're not breathing properly in the game and it's actually making you more anxious than you think. That's where I go back to that answer of yes, working with minors as early as possible as soon as they start performance maybe not when they're five years old, but once they're able to have conversations with individuals and really think critically about their performance and what they need uh, is definitely sooner rather than later when it comes to that. And it's certainly gonna get more competitive as, as you project and move on into the sport that you play. Again, a number of ways. I think a main component of all of the mental game is simply accepting things that the way they are and learning to be okay with that, even if it's uncomfortable and learning to embrace that and then having specific ways for you to let go or for you to move on. Because you're right, there's so many different things going on. Think about a high school athlete. They, they're in this club and they take this class and they need to study and then they're getting recruited and then they're studying for the SATs or the ACTs and then they do something else extracurricular and then they're a family member and they have this and that. So the balance component 
an intentionality component is, is absolutely massive. And what the specific skill is as far as being able to let go, it could be, again, that routine of knowing when the game starts, knowing when the game finishes. You can have a specific journaling exercise. I find that athletes that write about what they're experiencing as opposed to keeping it upstairs is a really mindful and deliberate way of you know putting it out there and letting it go. Um, giving yourself five minutes post game to kind of reflect, to think about things that you can improve upon, something that you actually did well, and then how you're gonna go back into your day-to-day -day training or your weekly training and work on that one thing that you felt you maybe let yourself down a little bit on or that you wanna improve on. You know, with the process of accepting and letting go, it's really easy for us to become very self-judgmental, uh, to be our biggest critic, and then we fail to be our biggest supporter, our biggest cheerleader, our biggest fan. And that can become very problematic in the sense of, well, if I expect myself to get here and I hit that mark and I don't celebrate it, but I'm going to beat myself up if I don't, you're only preparing yourself up to be frustrated in an ongoing sense. So in addition to having a, a post-game routine or even just journaling, I would say from a general standpoint, learn to be your biggest fan as well. as you were, If you're going to hold yourself accountable and want to improve, that's great, but don't forget to celebrate your successes too. That word is actually where I was going with that, productive. Thinking about self-awareness in this you know, umbrella, being the umbrella for mental game, mental performance is you need to understand what is it that you want in that situation. What is productive for you in that situation? And I think if I were sitting with an athlete right now who, you know, we could tell was kind of holding things in, I might just ask the simple question is, one, how is that working for you? They would respond. Two, I may ask, what is it that would help you right now? And three is, where do you need to be in order to perform? to perform successfully or up to your potential. And I think them learning the fact that internalizing things and holding things on only just leads to future suppression, avoidance of working on things, and that they're not going to improve allows them to have maybe not an aha moment, but a better understanding of, okay, so me not focusing on things that I actually need to focus on actually sets me back. Um, it brings to mind the concept of like avoiding things because it's uncomfortable. When in reality, if we're avoiding something, it may be a, a very immediate relief that is undeniable, but long term, we're just going to continue and continue and continue to, to lack that future growth potential that is there. If we were to just lean into that uncomfortable feeling, emotion, thought that that athlete was experiencing, if we could just bring that out to the surface for just a moment, look at it, and learn to manage that, then that leads to future movements and, and similar patterns moving forward. The, the way that I view my role with athletes and teams as to be a guide, um, not to be someone to tell them what to do or even how to do it. Now, if an athlete asks me for advice or a suggestion, I may say, so you want, to, you want me to give you an advi some advice, you're okay with that, yes. I would, I would talk to them about it then, obviously, but. I say that because I view myself as a, as a resource and as a support system, and I view my role as to empower the individual. And what that means as far as like life lessons and transferable skills, I think ultimately if I'm having a conversation and I'm empowering someone to dig deeper into the, the questions that they have, to answer their own questions that they have, and to take action on those things, number one thing that comes with empowerment is accountability and responsibility. And I think once you're willing to take full responsibility for the decisions that you make and the actions that you take, I mean, you just start to get so much clarity and liberation from all that that I think the number one skill that I think I, I strive to teach is that. And you know, you asking me that right now has really made me reflect on the work that I've, I've started to do and have been doing for a while. I think accountability is you know, at the center. Totally. It's, um, you know, something that I really enjoy doing is being able to have conversations with the athletes and teams that I work with and then going out and watching. Um, I find it so important. And again, that brings to, word, to mind that, that word accountability and responsibility. 
where if I'm having a conversation with someone on a routine and what that may look like, and then I go and watch them play and there's an absence of a routine or it changes a little bit, I'm not going to say, hey, why didn't you do your routine? But I'm going to have a conversation with them like, hey, tell me about the game. Well, how'd it go? Tell me about your routine. Um, what changed with your routine? And that ability to kind of view and observe is a really big component of the work that I feel like is, has been missing, obviously, due to the shutdown of the season in the past. And you know, not allowing fans at some places and, and not being able to, you know, be a spectator at certain events. So that's something that's certainly lacking that I am very excited to hopefully be able to, you know, add back into the services that I provide, knock on wood here pretty soon. A lot of, with that said, Zoom conferences, as I think we're all getting a little bit zoomed out, it's actually been an interesting process in the sense of having some built-in privacy um, I always find it interesting with Zoom where I view it as like they're letting me into their life a little bit. I think if we're one on one meeting at the baseball field, it's we're at a at a neutral site, if you if you will. And when I'm able to talk with someone they're on Zoom, they're letting me into their home. So there's this increased component of vulnerability that I definitely want to bring to the light because that's a, a difference with the work that I'm doing. In general, I think COVID has produced a lot a lot of uncertainty, um, a lot of what do I do now that the season isn't happening? What do I do now that I have to quarantine for 10 days and my roommates aren't and they're playing and now I'm not there? It's the number one thing I've asked is what's something that you feel like you could be doing? Maybe it's not I get to go to the weight room and lift heavy weights today, but can you get an exercise routine in, in your room? Uh, so being adaptable. Uh, being adjustable and learning to be curious with that abundance of free time that a lot of us had um, and working it in a, in, a, in a way that's productive and helpful for us uh, was something that was a large part of the conversation with COVID, especially when it first started. Um, getting mental reps is something that I should probably mention as well as far as visualization or imagery goes. If you're not going to get those physical reps, we can try to bring to about or bring about as vivid and as real images of us performing in our mind. So that's definitely brought about a little bit of a wrinkle to the work, but those are some of the changes. So I mentioned the, the website that I just launched. It's my consulting project, gophergold.net. It's G-O, the number four, G-O-L-D, my last name, dot net. Uh, if people are interested in connecting with me, I've linked my social medias there, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, I believe. And then, you know, as far as the podcasts go, that's, that's on my website as well. It's the Go For Gold show, spelled the same way. And that's really me having coaches as well as sports psychology professionals onto the podcast where we have conversations similar to this, talking about topics such as breathing, routines, uh, how to incorporate the mental game into practices, routine development, um, in general, life skills that come from being an athlete and, you know, having a purpose, having an identity that's healthy and robust and intentional based on what you're doing. Uh, that's some of the work that I do with the podcast. That's my website. As I mentioned, I am consulting with some teams around the country right now. And it's been a really fun process thus far. Um, still learning, still growing. So that's another life lesson that I've certainly learned from baseball as well as my mom. <laughs> but you know, continuing to grow each and every day, trying. And um, I think something that I would add is knowing that as an athlete that you're good enough to where you are and at the same time you're still at a place where you're humble enough to recognize that you still have some room to grow. And I view the mental game as a way for you to consistently almost be chasing this performance ceiling that's there for you, even though you may not actually reach it. So you're good enough where you're at, but we can continue to grow and, and take steps up that stairs so that we can try to get to our ceiling. And we may not be able to get there, but we can always strive for it.